Today's video is going to be part one of three as we talk about chapter five, instrumental conditioning foundations. So the same as with our classical conditioning, we talked about foundations and then mechanisms. For instrumental conditioning, we're going to be doing exactly the same, starting with our foundations. So for our outline, um, we're going to be talking about early investigations and modern approaches, and then we're going to start today talking about some instrumental conditioning procedures. Um, we'll wrap that up in the next video, and then we'll move on to fundamental elements. So far in the course, we've only really talked about elicited behavior, things like habituation, sensitization, or classical conditioning. And when we're talking about elicited behavior, we're specifically talking about um, behaviors that are occurring and not really requiring the animal to make any kind of conscious response in order to obtain their unconditioned stimulus, usually food. These elicited behaviors are how organisms adjust their behavior to the environment without having to intentionally make that change. So it kind of happens automatically through the processes that we've been talking about so far. Now we're going to start looking at situations in which the stimuli that our organisms are going to encounter are the results or consequences of its behavior. So we're coming into goal-directed or instrumental behavior. And so instead of elicited, you might see these kinds of behaviors referred to as evoked because elicited behaviors are going to kind of cause a certain response to happen, whereas evoked behaviors, like our upcoming instrumental conditioning, they're going to create the opportunity for the organism to make that behavior, but there's a little bit more uh, choice or decision, and I'm kind of using air quotes here because not everybody likes that terminology, uh, especially some of the more pure behaviorists, but I find it's a little bit easier to conceptualize using that term. So, All right, so now, now we're going to be looking at situations where our stimuli of interest occur as a consequence of an animal's behavior. So we're looking at what comes after the behavior, as opposed to before, where mostly we're looking at what comes before the behavior. Now you may have already figured out that instrumental and operant are terms that are used fairly interchangeably at this point. So we can talk about instrumental conditioning or operant conditioning, and we're referring to the same thing. So we can talk about instrumental or uh, operant behavior, which would be an activity that occurs because it is effective in producing a particular consequence or reinforcer. To kind of help it stick a little bit better, we could even say that this behavior itself is instrumental in producing a significant stimulus or outcome. It's significant in producing a particular consequence that we desire. An operant or instrumental response is going to be a response that's defined by the effect it produces in the environment. So this behavior, whether it be lever pressing or button pushing or whatever, is going to be done because it leads to a particular consequence that's desirable in that environment. In this goal-directed or instrumental or operant learning, Responding is key and necessary to produce the desired outcome, the consequence that we want. And experimental manipulation is going to be key in setting whatever our instrumental behavior is going to be. So if you want a rat to press a lever, there are steps that you're going to take so that that is the behavior that they're doing. And we're going to walk through all of the different parts of operant conditioning in the next couple of lectures. So just for some examples of ways that we might encounter uh, instrumental conditioning or operant conditioning in the real world, um, if you think of using a vending machine, that process is an instrumental behavior. Um, so when you put your money into a vending machine and then you press a button, you get a significant outcome. So putting your money in and pressing the right button is an instrumental behavior that's going to be reinforced by the fact that you get the thing that you wanted out of the machine. 
If we want an example of an operant response, maybe you're looking at basketball players. Getting a basketball into the hoop could be an operant response. There are tons of different ways to get a basketball into a hoop. You could use the backboard, you could bounce it in off the rim, you could have it go in, nothing but net. But each of those, despite being different variants of responses, would all count as the same operant response because you're still getting the ball through the hoop. So if we think about sort of the applications of all of this, we might come to the conclusion that our behavior is occurring because it was previously effective at producing certain consequences. Um, we say previously effective because it might still be effective, but, um, you know, once you've learned how to use a vending machine, you are going to keep using a vending machine, even if it's not necessarily reinforced all of the time. You might have a couple of bad experiences. Maybe there's one in vending machine in particular that you've used a few times and it doesn't always work. So your behavior isn't always being reinforced, but it has previously worked, so you might persist with it. But like I said, we're going to break down all of these individual components as we work through the chapter and even as we get into the next chapter. So let's keep moving. Let's start with a little bit of history. Um, and again, because you're at this level in psychology, you already know most of this history. This will just be a little bit of a refresher. We'll stick to pretty high level stuff so that you don't have to go over it in too much depth yet again. But when we start talking about operant conditioning, we're always going to start by talking about Thorndike. The Thorndike was known for his puzzle boxes. Um, they would be a single trial experience, basically look something like this in the bottom corner here. They'd have a bunch of different iterations with different types of solutions, but the same basic principle. So you'd have one of these boxes and you'd place a hungry animal in the box, usually a cat who hadn't yet had their breakfast. So you made sure that they were hungry so that they would be motivated to get outside of the box where there would be a plate of food that would be visible to the animal while they were in the box. And Thorndike would measure how long it takes for that animal to escape the box on successive trials. This was originally done to try and test animal intelligence and whether animals were learning through uh, sort of aha moments where they had a spurt of inspiration and they went from being unable to solve the problem to then being able to solve the problem, which we now know was not the case. Um, but what we did end up viewing was this uh, gradual change in behavior over time as behaviors that led to a successful escape were done more, and those that didn't lead to successful escape were done less. So this graph here shows what would have been pretty standard results for Thorndike's uh, observations. So we would have time it takes for the animal to escape on our y-axis, and then on our x-axis would just be successive trials, so time. Um, so the first time the organism was in the box, it would take them a very, very long time to figure out how to escape. Sometimes they wouldn't even figure it out the first or second time around. Then we see um, that they got out much, much, much quicker. The next time it took them a little while longer and then uh, faster than that and then faster again. Um, and so it sort of bounces around where the general trend is that they start by taking a long time and they eventually learn how to get out fairly quickly. And towards the end, if you leave them in the same box, um, doing the same kind of trials over and over again, they can escape almost immediately every single time once they've learned what the trick is for getting out. And so looking at these results, of course, Thorndike determined that they're not using insight. They're not having those aha moments where they would go from being able to not solve the problem for a very long time to suddenly they can solve it all the time. That's what we would have expected to see if they were using insight. Instead, we see this sort of gradual decrease um, that shows uh, baby, basically baby steps in their learning. They learn a little bit each time successively getting better um, and that their, in, uh, their new knowledge was gained through a process that kind of lines up with SR associations. Basically, they made an associative link between a stimulus and a response and that determined whether they did that particular response more or less frequent, frequently. He called this uh, his law of effect. 
And so we could say that if a response in the presence of a stimulus is followed by a satisfying event, then the association between that stimulus and the response is going to be strengthened. So if you're in a puzzle box and pushing on a lever opens the door, then whenever you're in that puzzle box, whenever you have those same environmental stimuli, you're going to press that lever more often because it led to you getting out, a satisfying event. So that strengthens the association. So the more you're uh, in that particular environment, the more you're going to do that response, and hopefully the more you get your satisfying event. So more and more strengthening of that particular uh, combination of behaviors. And the opposite is also true. If a response is followed by an annoying or undesirable event, something bad, then the association is going to be weakened. If pulling on a string doesn't get you out of the box, well, then it's annoying. It's bad that you're not out. So you're not going to do that again next time. So that association there with that particular response would be weakened. Now, this setup by Thorndike actually paved the way for the two basic types of trials that we tend to see in modern operant or instrumental conditioning today. So when we look at our modern studies, we tend to see um, either discrete trials or free operant uh, situations. So discrete trials, that's kind of like Thorndike's boxes because each time the cat escaped, it was a single trial. They are discrete and self-contained units where you test them once, and when the animal is out, they are out. So this would be similar to running a maze, or having something set up where you have to make one discrete choice and then the trial is over. Um, on the other side, we might have free operant, something like the operant boxes that we've mentioned a little bit so far. Um, things like having a pigeon in a box and choosing to peck a key. That would be free operant, um, where they're going to be making multiple trials, multiple key pecks in any given session. So we can divide these up and we can talk about each of them separately, um, but they all came from this original research with Thorndike and his puzzle boxes. So let's start with our discrete trial procedures. So as I've kind of already said, this is gonna involve an instrumental response produced once per trial. So you put the cat in the puzzle box and you are measuring one thing, how long it takes them to get out of that box. Um, and then when they're done, you record one measure because they've escaped the box once, they did their operant response once, now the trial is over. So they are discrete and self-contained trials. Each trial ends with the removal of the animal from the apparatus. So if a rat is running in a maze, when they find the goal, you take them out of the maze. With a cat who has figured out a puzzle box, by figuring it out, they have escaped the apparatus. So they are out of the apparatus. To start a new trial, you would have to pick the animal up and put them back at the beginning to start a second trial. Uh, a race would also be the equivalent of a discrete trial procedure because you all start at the starting line and you run till the finish line and whoever crosses first, that is the winner for that race, that trial. And you've probably seen mazes, um, especially at this point in your careers, but these are just a couple of different kinds of mazes. Um, I recently saw a tweet where someone had laughed about the fact that behaviorists looking at mazes, I don't necessarily think they understand what a maze is because, well, this one's a straight line. A runway maze is going from the start of a tunnel to the end of a tunnel. Or we have a T maze, which is you run to the end of the tunnel and choose to go left or right and you're done. We also have radial arm mazes where you start in the center and you can go out in sort of any of the directions. A little bit more simplified, you can have a plus maze, which is just as complicated as it sounds. So these mazes aren't necessarily complex and they aren't what non-psychologists would think of when we use the word maze, but here we are. Let's get off of my tangent and talk about why we actually use mazes. Now, maze use was originally really thought of for using with rats because 
Rats and mice and other rodents are really good lab animals. They're pretty easy to house in the lab, and you can have lots of them around, so you could run lots and lots of trials to get lots of information when you're doing your experiments. Now, you, we've kind of talked about setting up behaviors and choosing good behaviors um, for rats and mice and other rodents. In the wild, they tend to operate in burrows. So they're comfortable in smaller enclosed spaces, and they might even show fear effects if left out in the open. So if we design our individual apparatuses um, to sort of cater to that preference, to give them that environment that's more similar to what they're used to, then we can get uh, more reliable results, or at least control for some of our potential confounds. Now, when we have these different kinds of mazes, the usual idea is that they get from the start point to the goal. And the goal can be either one location, like the runway maze. Uh, in our T mazes, it can be either the left or the right. So there's two possible goals. In our plus maze, like I said, you'd start in the middle and then you have different goals at each end of the arm. We can turn that plus maze into a radial arm maze and double the number of potential goals that we have. Um, but no matter which maze we're using or how they're set up, there's a couple of different measures that we can use. Um, the first of these is running speed. Basically, how long does it take for that rodent to go from the start to the goal? How long does it take them to run from the beginning to the end of the maze? You might also measure latency, which is how long it takes for the rat to leave the starting box. As I had mentioned, Rodents like enclosed spaces, they're not a huge fan of open spaces, so they might be a little bit reluctant to leave the small enclosed space of the starting goal, even when the door is open to allow them into the rest of the maze. So we can measure latency, which is basically just the delay before they start running the maze properly. Now, latency tends to decrease as time goes on because they're becoming more and more familiar with the apparatus that they're running in. So at first, they might take a very long time to wait to start the test, but after a while, they're comfortable with it, so they're just going to start much, and much more quickly. We can also measure correct choices if there are more than one uh, goal options to choose from. So in a tea maze, if the rat is always given cheese on the right side, then we're going to measure how often they go to the right side. And you can decide which side is reinforced based on whatever experiment you're running, but you can record how many of those trials that they run, uh, they go to the correct sides. So you can get a correct uh, proportion of correct choices or something like that. And making that choice can be an operant behavior itself. So choosing to go right to where they know they're going to get food would be choosing a particular behavior that gets them a good consequence, a good outcome, which is getting food. So it kind of fits. Well, it absolutely fits, which is what we're talking about. All right, next we can talk about our free operant procedure. Now, this is the procedure that I have the most familiarity with. I've never really done mazes. Um, I've always done a free operant procedure, which would be something like an operant box. But the way that a free operant procedure is set up is that animals tend to remain in the apparatus for longer periods of time, not just for one trial, but for multiple trials. So they're put in the box for a number of, or for a session. Each session will consist of multiple trials. And during that session, they can make many, many responses. We don't have to have any intervention by the experimenter, meaning the experimenter doesn't have to go in and pick up the organism and put them back at the start like you do in a maze. In these operant, bro operant boxes, um, then you don't really have to move the organism. Everything happens in one room. Now, the operant box was originally developed by B.F. Skinner, so sometimes you'll see them called a Skinner box. So let's talk about the procedure and how it's a little bit different. So just like with our mazes requiring some kind of measurement to be made, our operant boxes, we're going to also have some kind of measurement. Now, usually we're gonna use something like response rate. Basically, how many times does the organism perform the operant response? 
So if we have rats in a box that have to press a lever, maybe we're going to measure how many times they press the lever in a session. Um, and you might display it as a ratio. You might say they press the lever 10 times per minute. Or you might say that they've pressed the lever 100 times in this 10-minute trial or this 10 minute session, sorry. So you can specify what your units are, but it's usually going to be um, how many times they're doing this particular response that we have defined at the beginning. Now we're gonna look briefly at different types of operant conditioning setups for different species. Um, there are videos linked on eClass so that you can actually see these in action. Usually I would show them in class, but I can't show other people's uh, YouTube videos in a YouTube video because that's plagiarism. So if you're somebody that videos help you conceptualize things, make sure you check out those videos. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to walk through them verbally for us here. Um, so let's start with the idea that um, the behavior that we're looking for is defined not in terms of the particular muscle movements that they have to make, but it's instead it's going to be defined in terms of how the behavior operates on the environment. So pressing a lever is pressing a lever. Whether you use your right paw or your left paw or your face, no matter which specific combination of movements leads that lever, lever to being depressed, the box doesn't care. As long as the lever is pushed, it's going to count as a response. And this is going to be the same for pretty much all of our free operant procedures. But if we look at this uh, image here, this is a very, very small operant box. Um, most of the ones that I've had experience with are much, much larger, especially if the organism's going to be in there for any length of time. You want to make sure that they have enough space, that they don't feel cramped. Um, so small boxes like this would nowadays only be used for very, very short experiments where they wouldn't be in there for too, too long. Um, but it lets us see everything all at once, so we can talk about it here. So we have an enclosed environment, and the rat is isolated where they have um, sort of these white circles here would probably be keys that could be illuminated different colors, uh, so different lights that they can see. What the rat has their paw on is a lever, and then at the bottom here we have a food hopper, which is basically a feeder where food can be made available if they make the correct response. Um, the bottom of the cage is just metal slats, and this is so that if the rat gets food, if they don't eat it right away, then it's going to fall through those slats and then not be available anymore. Otherwise, the rat could be storing food away and eating it later, which would affect our behavior results, which we really don't want. But if we want to look at the diagram here of this same basic setup, um, this would be looking at um, kind of a mirrored version. So this wall here is this wall here, where all of the control panel stuff is happening. So those are the two lights that we see. Those could be changed to different colors. Um, there's mention of a speaker here, which I guess might be this. Um, and these can be moved based on individual designs and needs. We have the lever in the middle and then the feeder at the bottom. So let's look at almost the exact same setup, but for pigeons. Um, so keep this image in mind because we're going to have almost the exact same setup, but with pigeons. Um, now the boxes tend to be customized for each species that you're working with. So rats have paws and can press a lever fairly easily. Pigeons do not. Uh, pigeons would probably struggle quite a bit with a lever. And so instead, what we tend to have are keys that can be pecked. Um, and again, there are different setups based on different labs. Um, I've seen a lot of really cool work with pigeons that actually just uses a touch screen. So they no longer have to have individual keys that light up different colors. Instead, they can use a touch screen and show them a whole array of different kinds of stimuli. But this is the same basic setup where the pigeon can peck any of these three keys, and if it is the correct response, they can be reinforced at the bottom here with food. So we can also have a speaker in here if we needed to, um, and then it's just the same kind of enclosed space. Usually, again, in practice, there'd be some kind of grating on the floor so that they can't store food for later. Um, but this is the same basic setup, just in pigeons. 
Now our next variant isn't going to show up in the textbook, and that's because this is the kind of setup that's been used in the lab that I've worked with. So we're going to find some differences here. Um, we can orient ourselves a little bit. So all of this stuff at the front here is the equivalent to that control panel. So we have a speaker that's present. We're going to have a light that's here, a red light. And then we're going to have a feeder that comes up whenever the bird makes the correct response so that they can get access to food. Now here, this feeder isn't controlled by pecking at that key or light. It isn't controlled by a lever. Instead, it's controlled by the bird hopping into the feeder. There are infrared beams within this feeder so that when the bird hops in, then it breaks the beam and tells the feeder that the bird is ready. And if they've made the correct response, the food cup will rise. Now, we use this specific setup because unlike pigeons who peck and are good at pecking, um, black hap chickadees aren't necessarily great at this. And so we found that it's easier to just have them hop into the feeder than to try and peck in a very specific spot. Um, and again, levers wouldn't work great either, so this was the solution they came up with. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you a video that's taken from the perspective of inside and behind the feeder here. So we'd be looking back into the cage so we can see the bird that sits on this perch here. Um, this is sort of a different setup than what we've seen in the other kinds of free operant procedures. Um, this perch is just called a request perch and it has another infrared beam. And when the bird sits on that perch, it breaks the beam and basically tells the system the bird is ready for the next trial. So sitting there tells the system to start a trial. And for these black capped chickadees, a trial involves a sound playing from this speaker. So for one of my experiments, I was looking at male and female black capped chickadee calls. So there was a 50-50 chance of the speaker playing a male call or a female call. And then the bird would listen to that song or that call. Um, it would have to stay on this perch, which is why the beam is still there. So it's going to register that they're staying there to listen. And then after this, the call plays, they choose if they want to make the response of going into the feeder or if they want to make the response of not going into the feeder. If you're familiar with uh, operant conditioning already, then this might be recognizable as a go, no go procedure where there are two possible responses. One is to go and hop in the feeder or press the button when they uh, see or hear one set of stimuli. And the other option is to not go, to be elsewhere when a particular sound or stimulus is seen or heard. Um, we use that kind of a setup because you can't really do a choice between two different sounds. It's really hard to distinguish between two sounds that are played simultaneously. So we'd have to play them one at a time and they should hop into the feeder for the ones that cause the food cup to rise and they should go elsewhere in the cage for the ones that don't cause the food cup to rise. So if this bird is in the group that gets reinforced for female calls, if they hear a female call and they go in the feeder, the food cup rises. They get reinforcement. That was the correct response. If they hear a male call and go into the feeder, then that was a wrong response and they don't get any food. And in fact, we go one step further and we just turn the lights out for a few seconds to let them know that their response was wrong. If they hear a male call, the correct response is to not go in the feeder. They can go anywhere else in the cage, but not in the feeder. So you can kind of see how that would be differential reinforcement, where we are reinforcing some behaviors, like going into the feeder after hearing a female call, and we would not be reinforcing other behaviors, like going into the feeder when you hear a male call. So we can get them to learn that one group is good and rewarded or reinforced, and the other group is not good and is not reinforced. All right, that is plenty of detail on that. Let's actually look at the video here. I'm going to skip over the early part of this because um, it's basically exactly what I have just said. But we're going to start at the first thing where they want to make a go response. So the bird sits there, they hear a song, 
Then they're going to hop in the feeder, and that was the food cup rising, and they got food. Very, very quick. Next is going to be a no-go response. Um, so the bird is not going to go in the feeder because they've heard a, a bad sound. So they hear the sound, they hop elsewhere, nothing happens. That was the correct response. Now we're going to see a quote-unquote punishment trial. So they're going to hear a sound. They shouldn't go in the feeder, but they go in the feeder and the lights turn off. Nice and simple. Um, it has just occurred to me that you probably don't have any audio from that video just because of the way that it's set up. Um, but if you watch this video on your own slides, you will be able to hear it. Um, just skip ahead to the 51 second mark to, to watch that. All right. Now, these operant procedures are all well and good. Um, mostly still talking about free operant procedures because they require the most extra steps. Um, but we're looking at things like having a bird respond to a particular sound by sitting in a feeder, or a rat pressing a lever, or a pigeon pecking a particular key. Those aren't behaviors that occur naturally. Those are things that would have had to have been trained. We would have had to show the organism what to do to get to that stage. That's where we get shaping, where you can shape their behavior to get them to do things that they wouldn't normally be doing. That's how we can establish our operant response. So that's how we establish pressing the lever, pecking the key, or flying into the feeder, our three operant responses that we've talked about. And even before we can start working on those operant responses, we'd have to set something up called magazine training. And this is basically a fancy way of saying that we're getting the animals used to using the feeders. So this setup is going to involve classical conditioning. Basically, we're getting them to associate the sound of that magazine or feeder with getting food. So the sound of our feeder would be our uh, soon-to-be conditioned stimulus. The food itself would be our unconditioned stimulus. And then we would eventually develop a conditioned response where they approach the food hopper so that they can then get access to that food. So step one in getting an organism comfortable in the operant box is to get them to know that there's food there and where they can get it. Um, with our black cap chickadees, I can actually scroll back here. So with our feeders, the first day that the chickadee is in one of these boxes, we leave the feeder up so that they learn that they can get food when they're inside this little enclosure. The next couple of days, the feeder will rise anytime they fly into the enclosure. So they learn that flying in here is how you get food. And then after that, the food cup will only rise if they fly into this enclosure if a light is on. So we're giving them conditions when they'll get food. Um, and then once they've figured that out, we consider them tr magazine trained. We figure that they know where the food is and what behavior they have to do to get it. Um, then we can start shaping. Though the magazine training itself does involve a little bit of shaping as well. But when we're doing our shaping, this is basically going to be how we're establishing our operant response. And that operant response is going to be our target or final response. That's our end goal. So step one in shaping is to define whatever our end goal is going to be. So if we want the bird to fly into the feeder whenever a sound plays, that's our end goal. If we want a rat to press a lever, that could be our end goal. Pigeon to pick a key. That's the end goal. Then we want to sit down and assess our starting performance. What does the organism do that is a simplified approximation of that behavior? So with the chickadees, just flying over to the feeder um, at the very beginning would be an approximation. Um, so if we leave the food up to reinforce them for flying into the feeder, that could be step one. Um, if we're looking at the rat, which would be a more standard version of shaping, maybe the first step is for them to approach the lever. Maybe they have to be on the correct side of the cage that's closest to that lever. If that's our starting point, then we can start dividing up all of the steps between our start point and our final response. How do we get 
from what they can do right now to our final operant response. So how do we get a rat from being in the cage with the lever to actually pressing it? So maybe step one, the first thing that we're going to reinforce is whenever they are on the correct side of the cage, whenever they're on the side of the cage that has the lever, they get reinforcement, they get food. Um, once they've figured out that they should be on that side of the cage near the lever, then we're going to stop reinforcing just being on the correct side of the cage. And now they have to sniff the lever. They have to get really, really close to it and almost touch it before they get reinforcement. Once they're doing that consistently, then you stop reinforcing that sniffing behavior and you're going to only reinforce when they touch the lever. Um, so then you're going to reinforce it until they touch the lever consistently, and then you stop reinforcing just touching it and only reinforce them when they actually press the lever down all the way. So for each step, you're reinforcing the next step and you're putting all of the previous steps through extinction by no longer reinforcing them. So we're shaping their behavior by encouraging them to do the next stage while discouraging them from doing something they were reinforced for before. So these two starting steps, which are very closely entwined, are basically how we're establishing that operant response and teaching that animal how to use our experimental setup. Um, and again, there is a video going over this if you are a visual person. So that is linked on eClass and on the slide here as well. Now this is a repeated slide, but this time it has uh, another video, this time with pigeons and shaping. So just like the previous one was rats and shaping, this is shaping pigeons to do something. Um, this is also, I guess, a great place for me to talk about. Um, when you're shaping a behavior, you can either use it to generate a completely new response, getting a rat to press a lever when they couldn't do it before, or you could get them to change or modify an existing behavior um, in order to get them to do something closer to what you actually want them to do. So maybe your dog barks all the time, but maybe you only want them to bark when you tell them to. Maybe you want to train them that they should only bark when you say speak. Um, so you can shape that existing barking behavior using the same basic procedure. And there's another video for that as well. Lots of cool videos for this channel. And I guess for my slides, I had intended to talk about how we shape um, the bird's behavior to use the feeder and to go into the feeder when the light is on um, at this point, but I already did that earlier. So instead of going over it again, I'll just acknowledge that I did it out of order. Um, but yeah, so we can use the same basic setup where we're training our chickadees to go into the feeder to use the magazine, but also to develop that operant behavior of hopping into the feeder when they see a light stimulus, or we can even take it one step further and we can um, stop reinforcing the light and start reinforcing going to the feeder when they hear a sound. So one extra shaping step to get to a slightly different operant behavior, um, but it's the same basic procedure. And this is just another look at that setup just as a pure line drawing. Um, this one with a zebra finch instead of a black capped chickadee. Uh, and that's because we've used this type of setup for multiple different kinds of species. So you can use black caps, you can use zebra finches, um, all sorts of small songbirds can be used using the same basic setup. Now, shaping isn't just for laboratory use. It isn't just for operant conditioning experiments. We can also see shaping used practically in the real world. Things like training animals to do tricks, whether that be teaching a killer whale to jump out of the water or getting your dog to sit when you tell them to sit. That all involves shaping. So with the dog example, maybe you're going to, um, the first time you tell your dog to sit, and you're going to push their bum down so that they are sitting. You're going to make them sit when you say sit, and then you give them a treat. And so the next time you're going to say sit, and you're going to push their bum down, and then you're going to give them a treat. And you can repeat that until maybe one time they're going to sit on their own. So you're going to tell them they did a good job, you're going to give them a treat. Next time, you're going to wait until they sit down on their own. You're not going to just 
make them sit yourself. You're going to wait until they start doing it themselves. So baby steps um, for uh, shaping there. Maybe you want to go from getting them to sit to now getting them to lie down. Um, so you can add on extra steps and change your target behavior at the end. Um, that's basically what they're doing when they're getting complex behaviors like whales and dolphins performing tricks at some of these, um, not quite zoos, but I guess attractions. We can also see it for vet care um, with captive animals. So here we have a veterinarian who is uh, tending to an elephant's feet. So this behavior of having the elephant lift their leg, you would train it basically the same way you would get your dog to learn to shake a so by getting them to do that behavior, by reinforcing that particular behavior and successive approximations that get them to that behavior, then we can um, do things like care for the animal properly. And shaping of behavior can even occur in nature, where, um, say, songbirds learning to sing can start adjusting or shaping their behavior to be more similar to whatever the opposite sex finds appealing. And it happens in human behavior. Um, stuff that we don't even realize we're doing can shape our behavior. Um, that's how children learn to speak. How parents can discipline their children, stop them from doing undesirable behaviors and encouraging desirable behaviors. Um, all sorts of different things can uh, come to be through shaping. But let's talk about that natural occurrence of shaping, and let's look at um, songs in a different kind of songbird species, the cowbird. So just a very little amount of background on cowbirds. Um, it's going to be similar to most songbirds. You don't need to know a whole heck of a lot about them. Um, but basically, the males sing to the females. They direct their song at the females for the purposes of mating. Um, usually, you'll also see that males can direct song at other males to compete for females. But we're going to be focusing on the male to female direction of singing. Now, previous older research had found that males, when they were housed in a colony room with other females, even if they were in separate cages, the males would change their songs. They would slowly adjust the way that they were singing to be more similar to what the females preferred. Now, of course, when the researchers found this, that the males were changing their songs, they wanted to figure out how they were doing this. What specific process is leading to this change? And based on what we've been talking about, I'm sure you can guess at this point that we're seeing some kind of shaping. So by observing what was going on when males were singing to females, these researchers looked at almost 20,000 different iterations of songs. Um, so these birds would have their own repertoires, different birds would have different groups of songs that they could sing, and they found that a small portion of these songs, only 237 out of the 18,000 they were looking at, they elicited a specific behavior from the females. So basically, when females heard these special songs, they would do what's called a wing stroke behavior. Um, and so at the bottom here, we have actual images of these birds. So this would be the female. This would be the male. The male sings to the female. And so at first, she's sitting there just normally, wings tucked in, watching the male. If she likes the song, she does this thing where she lifts and sort of strokes or waves her wings just a little bit. And that would be a good response because that wing stroke response is basically the female indicating that she's receptive to mating. So this is a diagram showing more detail than these blurry pixels. Um, but basically the female adjusts her posture, leans forward a little bit, lifts her head up and back, um, would have their wings open and fluttering, and would lift their tail forward, basically assuming a mating posture. And so to pick out what was going on in this setup, the researchers decided, okay, well, let's look at what could be going on. Let's figure out all these moving parts. So step one was to see, okay, are these songs that are eliciting this wing stroke behavior, are they actually something that the females prefer? So they set up 
an experiment where they could look at uh, what the females did in response to different kinds of songs. So they looked at songs that had previously elicited this wing stroke behavior, and then they looked at songs that did not elicit a wing stroke behavior. And then they compared, okay, well, how many uh, copulatory responses, how much of that mating behavior do we see in these females? And so this diagram here just shows our mean percentage of times that they would display copulatory responses after hearing the different kinds of songs. Um, here, we're, we basically care about the black bars. The black bars are the wing stroke songs. The uh, white ones and the uh, sort of diagonal striped ones are just the non wing stroke songs that came before and immediately after the wing stroke song. So these are just normal songs that didn't evoke a wing, wing stroke. And so they had five different iterations, but in each of these they found that there was a much higher percentage of copulatory responses to the wing stroke songs and much less to either of the other songs that came before or after it. And so when they were doing this, each of these five different experiments were using songs from different males to make sure that it wasn't just responding to one particular male or something like that. So they tried to control for as many different variables as they could. So what they took from this was that these wing stroke songs were the preferred songs, and they were preferred across multiple males, meaning that this was something that probably applied to all cowbird males. So we have this now idea that, okay, so these types of songs are the kinds of songs that the females prefer and are more likely to mate after hearing. That sounds like a pretty good reason for the males to start shifting their behavior, to shift their singing, to be closer to the songs that elicit this kind of behavior. Because as we said, mating is the intention of these songs. So we know that the females are responding specifically to those certain songs. It's not just a single male. It's not weird circumstances. They're doing it consistently. Okay, step two is to figure out are the males going to be changing their behavior based on the visual responses of the females? So is the male's behavior, their songs, being shaped by their environment, by seeing these females respond to how they're singing? Now, there's a note here from the original authors that state that the males aren't copying the behavior that the females produce. So they aren't just imitating the females. They're not tilting their heads forward. They're not stroking their wings. None of that. Instead, they might be learning to adjust their song based on the contingencies that exist between their behavior and the female's behavior. Um, basically, the more the female does that desirable behavior, the more the male knows that their song is adjusting in the right direction. So it's not so much the behavior itself um, being something they want to copy, it's they want to sing in such a way that it causes that behavior to happen. And so for this second experiment, they wanted to look at how female preference might shape the male's singing behavior. So they had 12 juvenile male cowbirds. So when they're juveniles, they're just learning to produce their songs. So their song type is a little bit more flexible. And they'd be housed with one of two distinct groups. They would have local females or distant females. Um, and basically each little community would have their own preferred type of song. So the local females would prefer one type of song and the distant females would prefer another type of song. And our goal would be to see if these juveniles would shift their behavior to match the type of song preferred by the local or distant females based on whoever they were being housed with. For the results of this experiment, our local population females, um, the LP females, produced more wing strokes on average. So we saw a lot more responding with the local females than we did with the remote females, which might make sense considering that the males were from the local population as well. Um, 
after a wing stroke was elicited, the males were a lot more likely to do things that would be leading up to mating. So either directed song or look and approach. So I'm going to switch to the next slide where we actually have the visual representation of this here. Um, so looking at this graph here, we're seeing a mean proportion. Basically, how often is this behavior occurring? We have our distant population, so the ones, the females from further away, and the local population, the females that are closer, um, and the two bars are grouped by whatever behavior we're seeing after a wing stroke was elicited. So we'd see a lot more directed song where the male figured out that the female was receptive and would repeat the song directly toward that female. We'd also see a lot more of look and approach, where they would turn to face that female and even approach them, get closer to them. So these are significantly different. So the males were um, doing a lot better and having more of this mating precursor behavior with the local population females. Um, so as I said, the males all came from the same population, that local population. So our local population of females giving a lot more wing strokes, they were basically giving the males a lot more feedback, a lot more consequences so that they knew if they were doing better or worse. And so as they were giving more of this feedback, the males would do better and more desirable songs, leading to more of the following behaviors that would be closer to them um, being able to mate as opposed to the other group where they got less feedback, maybe their singing wasn't as good, they were getting fewer wing strokes, and even when they got the wing strokes, the behaviors were less likely to continue towards mating. So it's likely that the female behavior, the feedback that they were giving, was critical in creating this difference between the groups. Um, the females being more receptive led to the males singing better, and their better singing led to more mating-like behaviors. So this would be an example of non-vocal shaping, where the females aren't vocalizing, they're just adjusting their behavior or responding behaviorally, and the males make a connection between their own behavior, their own singing, and the external reinforcer, which is that wing stroke behavior in the females. So this is how we can see shaping occurring in nature, and it would then lead to more successful mating if you're singing in such a way as to elicit mating behaviors. And just quickly, we can go over some of the other stuff that they observed from this same experiment. They found that males that produced more directed songs required less time to reach the onset of stereotyped learning. Um, so this is a fancy way of basically saying that if they got to the point where they were getting wing strokes fairly frequently, they were doing a lot of directed singing at a particular female, they settled on sort of their finalized or stereotyped song more quickly. So they found that this is successful, I'm getting the response I want, this must be a good song. So they would stop adjusting their song, they'd sort of arrive at their final form of that song and leave it be. Um, before this, the song would be plastic, meaning that it's still malleable and shapeable, but once they've um, sort of had enough success, they would basically become stereotyped, it would become set in stone and become more rigid. Um, and that process of it solidifying at a particular type of song would happen faster if they were more successful earlier on. Kind of makes sense. The females tended to produce more copulatory responses as the frequency of directed song increased. So as we see more and more of this directed song, the females were showing more and more copulatory responses, which kind of makes sense because that directed song would be uh, a precursor to mating. So as the males were getting more wing strokes, they were then transitioning to more directed song and it was leading to them getting more copulatory responses. So that positive slope here. As the proportion of wing strokes increased, it took males less time to reach the onset of stereotyped song. 
Basically, the more feedback that they were getting, the faster they learned the correct type of song to produce that wing stroke. And that makes sense. When we're looking at reinforcement and shaping behavior, we see that um, shaping progresses a lot faster as you get more and more reinforcement. So as they're getting more feedback, they're going to learn the right song a lot faster. And as proportion of wing strokes increased, so did the rate of copulatory postures. So we're seeing that positive correlation where the more they were singing in such a way that evoked a wing stroke behavior, the more likely they were to get to mate after it. So all of these together tell us that this system is probably a situation where the female's behavior is shaping the male's singing and it's leading to them singing in a more efficient way, which allows them to mate more often. So shaping in nature. Um, and we're actually going to leave it here for today and we'll keep going with more of the basics of print conditioning in the next lecture following reading week.